elephants, they are really, I can say they're really very intelligent. And they do mourn like the way human beings mourn. They can even mourn like uh, almost like six months, go back to the same place mourning. They, they know she died here even after six months, even they have very good memory. What elephant they have, they have very poor eyesight, but they have very good memory. For 21 years, Katito Sayalel has been part of a group studying the elephants in the Amboseli ecosystem. It is a major transition from what brought her here initially to work as a housekeeper in one of the lodges inside the Amboseli National Park. Now she is a research assistant with the Amboseli Trust for Elephants, an organization that has been working here since 1972. So it is my passion and I've been falling in love with elephants. What is this one called? Uh, this is called... She's a female, she's born 2004. How do you know that? Uh, we, we have a... We, have, we, take left, we take pictures, we have ID photo, we ID them and take the photograph so we know each an elephant. When they are five years old, they all have ID photo and we have our senses. Uh, this is a, this is a, a C a I C family. This is her name. Elisha. Elisha. Elisha, yeah. Ah. Yeah, Elisha, yeah. She's she's pregnant. Oh, yeah. I, how I can tell? Uh, that is her first pregnancy, born 2004. She I can was see. Born in 2004. 2004. We have all the record. Mm. This is her. Yeah, this is the year she was born. Okay. And they made her call three holes. And why she was named three holes? When Cynthia saw her, she had three holes, two, three holes okay. that are here, and they still remain the same even since I joined the project. Mm. So where the, is she now? The matriarch. The matriarch could be there. She is the over there. The big female with ah. beautiful tusks. Ah. Yeah, she's the. Yeah, as I say, you see the one make protect the family. Mm. Now she's behind the whole family. Sometimes you can find her at the back, or in the middle, or in the front. Protect the family. Her work as a researcher has enabled her to interact with numerous people. Hollywood celebrities, for instance, Lupita Nyong'o, here seen shooting an announcement for Wild Aid, and the first lady of Kenya, Margaret Kenyatta, when she launched her campaign against elephant poaching, Hands Off Our Elephants. I think it's a combination of the publicity. I think the first lady and her support has been phenomenal, and I think all of these things come together. Dr. Richard Leakey, the chairman of the Kenya Wildlife Service, appreciates the work of activists and researchers like Katito in combating poaching, but he says there is room for more. What I think we haven't um, really paid much attention to is that our neighbour, Tanzania, has sadly had massive poaching in the last few years. I mean, 30, 40, 50,000 elephants have died. Much of that ivory found its way out to the east and to China through Kenya. It was a lot of trafficking. While the researchers may keep an eye on an individual elephant in the wild, the work is often rendered futile by corrupt government officials who aid the poaching and trafficking of wildlife trophies. Many of the outlets, uh, airport, um, bus port, some of the smaller jetties and ports in places like Shimoni and, and other places, um, bribery plays a big factor and I, I think the control over what comes in and what goes out of our main port in, in the terminal um, areas uh, on the key sides is very serious. While poaching has reduced considerably in Kenya since 2012, it is the trafficking of ivory and rhino horns that is now a big problem and keeps Leakey worried most of the time. In the last two years, there have been major seizures of ivory suspected to have originated from Kenya through the Mombasa port. Sources who have spoken to NTV insist that it is almost impossible to ship anything illegal without the aid of corrupt Kenya Revenue Authority officials. While the shipping process involves several players, the verification of the contents of a particular container has always been the function of the Kenya Revenue Authority. And perhaps that is where the problem is. All containers shipped out of the country have to be packed and sealed in the presence of customs officials. They are also tasked with inspecting and scanning all exports and imports to detect any illegal shipments. I believe there is a massive uh, criminal cartel managing most of what goes on in the port. 
Now clearly, if, if ivory can get in and get out, that's happening. Uh, we are not responsible for the port, and it's very difficult for us to know, but so much ivory has been seized, and we know that so much ivory seized is a small percentage of what must have gone. In a bid to speed up the shipment of tea, Kenya's highest income Anna, the government struck a deal with tea exporters that would see the produce go and scan. Unscrupulous dealers quickly took advantage of this loophole. In April 2015, a shipment of ivory disguised as tea was caught in Bangkok. Suspected corrupt customs, port and shipping agents were arrested and now face conviction in Kenya. You do business with him. Corruption in wildlife crime is, is is a very huge driver of the of the offense, and especially in terms of transboundary wildlife, um, transboundary trade in illegal wildlife uh, products, um, we have seen it in Kenyan courts quite a number of, a number of times. And, and the problem is that it's very nuanced in the sector. Corruption hides behind incompetence, and it also hides behind uh, lack of capacity. Elizabeth Gitare is the legal officer at Wildlife Direct, an NGO in Kenya that campaigns for the rights and protection of wildlife in the country. We caught up with her in Mombasa, sitting with the prosecution in the trial of Mohammed Ali Faisal. Faisal and his five co-accused are charged with being in possession of and attempting to traffic three tons of ivory from Tudor, a suburb of Mombasa. Because of the nature of the evidence the court has had to adapt and all the sessions are now being held here in the open next to the strong room where the evidence is always kept. Gitari's work involves not just listening to the arguments in the court but also looking out for instances which may raise eyebrows. Such cases include that of Nfali Dukure, a Guinean national who was accused of trafficking rhino horns, but who was deported out of the country before his trial was concluded. Nfali had earlier been arrested in Bangkok with nearly 10 kilos of rhino horns in his traveling luggage. And the law provides that um, if you are a persona non grata in Kenya and you have been charged with an offense, uh, you know, an offence under the Kenyan laws, you, you, the trial process ends, you're convicted or acquitted. If you're convicted, you're sentenced to a, a jail sentence, you're given a custodial sentence or not, and once you have cleared your responsibilities under that conviction, then you're deported back to your country. It has happened on more than one occasion. Two Chinese men, Gao Gung Jian and Wang Tao, were also deported before their case was concluded. They had been charged with illegal possession of ivory. In the first trial of Faisal, presided by the interdicted magistrate, he was let out on bail. Yet a higher court had denied him the same. Another suspicious ruling allegedly allowed the suspects to tamper with the crime scene. So all of these things, it's very possible to be benevolent and say there is lack of capacity in government on how to handle it. But we, we have to be the devil's advocate here and really ask, is it lack of capacity or is it something a lot more sinister? According to the Kenya Wildlife Service, there were 146 prosecutions of wildlife crimes in 2012. In the same year, only 37 were convicted. In 2013, 212 were prosecuted and 97 convicted, while in 2014, 257 individuals were prosecuted and only 40 were convicted. In the same period, there were 15 acquittals and 18 withdrawals due to insufficient evidence or suspects not showing up in court. But what worries Kenyan campaigners more is what is happening in Tanzania. The nation has lost 60% of its elephant population in the last five years. In Selu and Ruaha, some of the biggest elephant homelands in the country, the situation is dire. Um. No one knows that story better than Hamis Kagasheki, the country's former minister for natural resources. His campaign, dubbed Operation Tokomeza, meaning Operation Terminate in 2013, intended to eliminate poaching in Tanzania and eradicate entire networks from the poachers to the politicians and some of the country's rich men accused of being part of it. Actually, I remember one of my friends telling me, saying that, Agasheki, uh, you are actually now uh, moving into a most, most dangerous territory, meaning of course, you are moving into an area whereby 
uh, you have the big boys there, and uh, they have uh, their, 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 their business there, and they have their, their money there. And I said regardless, because I had a duty and I had a responsibility. But of course they proved that indeed, yes, they are powerful, because I could see what actually happened to, to, to some of us. The operation to end poaching was hastily stopped because it was accused of human rights violations such as beatings, sexual assault and even murder. Kagasheki and three other ministers were dismissed after a motion was tabled in parliament. But two years after his dismissal and after losing his parliamentary seat, Kagasheki still defends his operation. He blames his exit on politicians who are benefiting from poaching. We actually came to learn that it was obvious uh, that uh, our colleague, fellow politicians, were definitely on the, uh, on the payroll of, uh, of, of these poachers. Because it is, it is not even a secret that it has been said time and again that there are some members of parliament who were actually paid uh, in order to, I, I wouldn't say crucify me in the parliament, but certainly to make sure that uh, I was removed in the government. And this, uh, quite a number of members of parliament, they actually said that this kind of thing was, uh, was, was happening. Therefore, obviously, if, for example, it is being said that money was given uh, uh, and a lot of effort was made to make sure that uh, I am removed from, from that portfolio, uh, obviously, it, uh, it makes me believe that uh, I was uh, a stumbling block into, into, in, 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 into these efforts. Actually, the language they were using was, they were saying that, Walipewa Bahasha. You know, Bahasha meaning they were given uh, uh, some money in order. Uh, the, the poachers were giving Bahasha to, 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 to the then, of course, members of parliament. But the biggest proof of corruption driving the poaching and trafficking industry in Tanzania was in June 2015, when these three Chinese men were caught brazenly flying out of Tanzania's Julius Nyerere Airport with these bags of ivory in tow. It was clear that they had the blessings of corrupt officials in Tanzania. The Chinese men were searched and arrested upon arrival in Zurich. Sadly, for campaigners like Mwarabu who want action, the three men have never been brought to Tanzania to be charged, even though the security and airport officials seen here were dismissed and charged. The, the, the hands of the, the past government, of Kikweta government, uh, he probably had the, his hands tied up with everyone because you had effectively a lot of very high profile kingpins and high profile ranking people uh, buying ivory not obviously going to hunt for the elephant but buying ivory Tanzanians not just Chinese and selling it to their Chinese friends since they were very close to the Chinese this is the Westerners. Michelle Lanfrey is a director of Ascari Maritime Logistics a security company that, together with the government's National and Transnational Serious Crimes Investigations Unit and a donor organization, PAMS Foundation, have joined hands to end poaching in Tanzania. They have taken a more pragmatic approach, Michelle says. They are targeting the actual poachers and the middlemen. So what does NTSCIU done is to cut the grass under the feet of the important people so today, if you have a million dollars and you want to buy ivory in Tanzania, good luck, my friend. You can't do it. It's very complicated and very difficult and extremely dangerous because, because we know and we are overlooking and uh, so, uh, so much the, the, um, so much the, the criminal uh, gangs and the networks that if you show your face or you say to the wrong guy that you want to buy $100,000 for ivory, you'll probably see NTS here, you knocking your door. And today, there's no protection at no levels. The new approach may be criticized for not going after the politicians and major businessmen suspected of poaching and ivory trafficking. They include the Secretary General of the ruling party in Tanzania, CCM, Abdul Rahman Kinana, whose shipping companies were said to have moved tons of ivory netted in Vietnam in 2009 in a report by the Environmental Investigations Agency. Several other members of parliament had been mentioned.
It, it's not what is important. Important is to stop the killing of the elephants. It's not to start uh, arresting uh, a lot of big people and then to that that was a very bad habit that has been ongoing for ages. No, for ages it has been ongoing anyway. Yeah? Authorized with a blind eye, uh, uh, with a blind eye by the authorities, whoever they are. So, anyway, uh, so many people have done it in this country that we, what what do we what do we start to do? To say we want to arrest 20% of the MPs and and, and a few ministers, a few PS, doesn't make any sense. You know? So it doesn't make any sense politically. Trust me, it doesn't make any sense. And in this Israeli wisdom definitely wisdom we are cutting the grass under the feet of anyone who wants to who wants to to to, to deal uh, with this criminal activity today a few days after we recorded this interview Roger Goa, a helicopter pilot was shot dead by poachers as he was transporting an anti-poaching unit Lanfrey and his men clearly have more work to do while they have arrested big names suspected of facilitating poaching and trafficking of ivory, including Yang Feng, a Chinese nicknamed the Ivory Queen, and this man, Boniface Mariango, nicknamed Shitani or the Devil because of his looks, the work may have just begun. Many of the big elephant herds in Tanzania are gone. We still have many elephants in Kenya. Are we sure that these same people who are killing elephants there are now not going to come here into our country? And I think they will probably try. I think we will meet them. And I think they will find Kenya is not Tanzania. Uh, we shall see. They tried. In February 2016, a rhino that normally roams between the Maasai Mara in Kenya and the Serengeti in Tanzania was killed by poachers near the Kenyan border.